You're listening to the We Are Libertarians podcast network. Find all of our shows at wearelibertarians.com. Welcome to the Chris Spangle Show. Thank you so much for joining me here on this episode. This is a often requested topic that we have here on the show, and it is the cancellation of student loan debt. I know many of you listening probably have a tremendous amount of debt, and you just like that to man- magically disappear. I, I get it. Um, but we're going to talk about what proposals are on the table, what effect it might have, what are the trade offs, and how we can deal with the student debt crisis. So, with me today is Jack Salmon. He is a research assistant at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. His research and commentary have been featured in a variety of outlets, including The Hill, Business Insider, the Foundation for Economic Education, and Dallas, the Dallas Morning News. He's also a Young Voices contributor, as is Sean Tima, who serves as Chief of Staff for the Young Americans for Liberty. He's a recovering progressive. All right, we want him over. Sean has appeared on Fox Business, Newsmax, The First TV, and OAN. He is also, like I said, a Young Voices contributor. Thank you so much to both of you for coming on the program to talk about this. Yeah, great to be here. Thanks for having Thanks us. Thanks for having us. So let's let's get started. I mean, can either of you, uh, d- depending on who wants to take this first here, give us an, an idea of the size and scope? I think everybody kind of has their own personal experience with student debt, you know, $600 a month payment that they're making for the rest of their lives. You know, sometimes we deal in some of the more fantastical stuff like the philosophy major who, uh, you know, has $500,000 in student debt, but is making 27000 at Starbucks. I don't know how much of that is real. Like if we call this a crisis, Sean, is that an accurate description of what's actually going on out there? Yes and no. What you hear in the news a lot when this is talked about, usually from a perspective of student debt cancellation, is that every single person is a victim of this predatory system and that there is nothing we can do besides canceling student debt or else we're going to have everybody stuck in, you know, everyone's going to be equally poor and no one's going to dig themselves out. Right now, that is true for some people. You've got the philosophy majors, the film majors who are in six figures of debt. But the majority of people who own student debt in this country are the white collar folks, the people who pursued PhDs, law degrees, advanced, uh, you know, technical master's degrees. And also about half of the people who have taken on student debt in this country have paid it off. So that's, you know, one out of every two people has been responsible and paid back what they have decided to take out, right? So it's it's really anecdotal, uh, every situation for student debt in this country. But one thing that I believe to be true is, well, actually two things, if we got the time for it, is it's wrong to rob Peter to pay Paul, and we should not simply say, oh, some people in this country are in debt, therefore we should steal from the other half of the country, You know, particularly when that will be stealing from blue-collar workers and people who paid off their debt to pay off gender studies majors and underwater basket weaving majors, and also canceling student debt will actually do nothing to solve the bigger problem, which is the high cost of education jacked up by the federal government. So that is my opening salvo. <laughs> and Jack, I mean, what's what's your take on the size and scope of the issue that we're facing? I So I agree with everything that Sean just covered there. Um, I, I, I've also looked into issues of, of uh, federal financing of higher education and how that actually trickles through to it creating t- tuition inflation. Um, most of the empirical literature on that end tends to find that about every dollar of federal financing of higher education actually comes through at about 80 cents increase in tuition prices. So it's, it's almost a dollar for dollar um, effect. Um, but but my take on this was 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 more looking at the uh, the regressive effects of this policy, this specific policy. This isn't the first time we've we've had Proposals that are super aggressive. Um, you know, we we had the salt deduction argument earlier last year, and now we have this um, ten thousand um, dollar loan payment um, cancellation proposal on the table, which which, as Sean rightly said, primarily benefits those high income white collar workers, um, doctors, lawyers. Those are the ones who would benefit most from from, from these moves. Those making uh, six figure salaries, and um, it's hard to sell that to those who have paid off their debt, as you said, about half of the students who have paid off their debt. But it's even harder to sell it to those who never went to college, 
about two thirds of Americans chose not to go to college. That was a decision they made and they shouldn't be forced to, to have a heavier tax burden in order to fund the debt that we're going to accrue from, from passing a policy like this. So let's let's jump back to the beginning, Sean. I mean, how did I mean that figure of eighty cents tuition basically increasing dollar for dollar is is really stunning, and it makes sense. I went to college back. I didn't get my degree, but I went to college back in the early two thousands um, to mid two thousands. Paid off my loans, um, but it you know that was thirteen thousand for roughly half the the credit hours towards a degree. It's so much more expensive now. What what happened between my last year of college in 2005 and then the last semester that I took in 2020? What what changed that made it so much more expensive over these 15 years? Well, besides the Federal Reserve endlessly printing money, which increases the cost of everything, you've <laughs> got the higher education cartel at work. It's why the cost of college has increased for everybody. The, the higher education cartels made up, of course, of the banks, federal government, Sally Mae, and college administrators, right? These are the people who benefit from the cost of college increasing beyond the point of affordability. When you've got the federal government covering 92% of all student loans, right? Those are federally guaranteed, 92% of all student loans, you're writing the colleges a blank check to say, you can keep increasing the price of tuition perennially. And no matter what, we're going to cover these loans. You're going to get paid off. The student may never be able to pay it off, but we are all going to make a profit from the interest. We're going to make a profit from the higher tuition costs. Uh, we're essentially going to you know, put shackles on these people uh, and, and we'll be able to do whatever we want you know, with the money. Um, so when you've got a system that continues to let the cost of something increase without recourse, then of course the cost is going to keep going up because there's the incentive for administrators to spend it on bloated social justice programs and DEI programs, give themselves raises at my alma mater. The uh, university president you know, essentially tripled her salary over three years while laying off faculty. Um, you've got bankers and Sally Mae executives making money off of the interest, and you've got the federal government having control over young people. So that's why the cost of college has increased and will continue to increase until I believe we do something drastic, like put a big stop to the federal student loan program altogether until we can figure out what's going on. Yeah. I don't know if you two are familiar with uh, Mitch Daniels, praise be his name. He was the governor here in Indiana and he's now head of Purdue and has gone in and frozen tuition for about a decade because he went in and found a lot of waste and hasn't increased tuition at all. Because his premise was, I bet there's a lot of waste that we can cut. And guess what? Everybody that works at Purdue has gotten raises, and they love Mitch. Um, and, and so that, that rings true. So when you say it's federally guaranteed, Jack, feel free to answer this or add anything that, that Sean said. But you know, when, uh, let's just make this super simple for people. When you say it's fed, a federally guaranteed loan, what does that mean? Does that mean that I just don't have to pay it and the federal government's going to pay it? Jack, you Jack can't see it. Yeah. Oh, that's good for me. Sorry. Um, uh, that's that's a, that's essentially the premise behind it, um, and 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 that that tends to be about. Uh, I think you said it was over ninety percent of of all student loan debt is 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 federally backed loans. Um, so that's the risk is ultimately there on the taxpayer. I mean, it's on the students, but at the end of the day, it's it the, the ultimate risk falls on the taxpayer if if those loans aren't aren't paid back. Um, and that's why this proposal is is, is, so, is so expensive because it, it, it just adds to the national debt. It's, I think the cost estimate for the $10,000 um, forgiveness was $321 billion, which at a time when the Federal Reserve is, is, is trying to reduce excess demand and we're trying to redu reduce budget deficits, we're going to be giving everybody roughly $100 for $46 million students who have loan debt that's more excess demand that's higher inflation that's larger budget deficits um and and the benefits of this as i said they're, they're primarily good um i just i just thought of a, um the, the committee for a responsible federal budget did some some cost estimates on this um and they they found that about 75 percent of the benefits goes to those in the in the top quartile of of income earners but they also found that the current policy of the administration 
which at the moment has been to defer loan repayments plus interest repayments. This, is, this has been the policy since March 2020, which, which may have made some sense at the time, but makes no sense today. Um, it's, it's the cost estimate from March this year found that uh, about $48,000 um, of the benefits were, were going to medical school graduates. So that's, that's the average for a medical school graduate that have benefited from $48,000 um, from those payments being frozen, whereas the average bachelor student benefited from about $4,000. Uh, if, you, if you look at where those, um, those medical student graduates end up working, they tend to be phys physicians and those sorts of jobs, they're making about $248,000 a year, um, whereas the average ba bachelor's degree uh, graduate isn't, isn't making anywhere near that much. And so there's- You say that like it's not a, the cost of a tank of gas right now. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, that that's the uh, I guess uh, part of the confusion for people comes in, Sean, like I'm still on the hook for it if I don't pay it. So why if it's not backed by the federal government, like I, I don't get it. Why do I have to pay if I, I can't go bankrupt on this? I can't afford to pay it. So how do how do they actually take control of the system and federally back these loans? Yeah. You know the backstory. Yeah. So if I understand your question correctly, the colleges, you know, they get covered by the federal government no matter what, in the sense that they say, don't worry, you know, we'll make sure that, that you get the money back because we're going to have these people, you know, kind of perennially in debt to us. They'll pay off the loans. We've got the money. We can give it to you if we want. We'll give you the money, but we're going to keep these people on the hook for the debt, right? right? So if they really want to, you know, they can just print the money pay off the college, they're good. You know, they're, they're, they're strange bedfellows in that sense, the universities and DC in the sense that they know they're not going to go bust on each other. The students may go bust. And in which case they're going to have to be further in debt on interest and just forever in this cycle. So, you know, in the sense that they're guaranteed uh, in the sense that you government could just keep printing the money if they really want to, right? The government is the banker in this game of monopoly, um, and the students who do sign up for this, and we talk a lot about, you know, how this is a bit of a predatory system, but we also know what we're getting ourselves into. And we're also, you know, if legal adults at 18, we can decide, you know what, college, maybe this isn't the smartest move for me. Maybe I'm not a scholar and I don't need to go get a liberal arts degree uh, as the best way for me to make money. Maybe I go to trade school. Maybe I wait a little bit and, and discover myself a little bit more. Maybe I look at alternative programs like Praxis, which allow me to uh, pay back my tuition guaranteed after 18 months of training, right? I think we got to remind ourselves, you know, we're talking about this crisis and how, oh, everybody's in debt. We've got to cancel this debt. I mean, there's still an element of personal responsibility here that we can't just look aside. So, Jack, what is the – can you start from the beginning with the, the proposal that's on the table and, you know, who's pushing it? What exactly is being proposed by the federal government and who does it apply to? So the original proposals were actually included in, in the, um, the Build Back Better agenda that was put forward last year. But that, considering that that died uh, over the winter, there have been prog the progressive wing of the administration has been pushing for, for large amounts of student loan forgiveness. The more progressive wing is asking for $50,000 at, at least of forgiveness. Um, and so there's pressure on the administration to, to sort of um, fulfill those needs, but they're not willing to go, to go quite that far is, is what they've said. So the figure that we keep seeing is $10,000 per borrower of loan forgiveness um, with progressive wing within the administration. How could they, how could they do $10,000 of student loan forgiveness through an executive order? How would that even be legal? Do you have insight into that? I, I, I don't have insight into the legal. Okay, I didn't think you did. Like, we're all just making it up now. We're all making it up since the pandemic, especially. Uh, why did they settle on $10,000? I know a lot of people have a lot more. Why, why not $100,000? Why not? You know, it's the minimum wage argument, right? Like, well, now, fifth, now everybody's at 15 hour. Why not 30? You start you start seeing, um, you know, Sean's old progressive friends saying, well, why not $30 an hour? The gas... So why why not why stop at ten? I I don't think there's a there's a specific reason for this magic number. I I feel it's more compromise between nothing and fifty thousand, and it's also a, a a potential voting gift that close to the um the midterms 
particularly if they're trying to win over younger voters who latest polling data shows they're not doing too well with. That's, yeah. that, that's, that's my only take on that figure. No, I totally agree with Jack. I mean, I don't know exactly why they settled on 10,000. My prediction is the same, uh, you know, group of focus, you know, associates focus group got together and pitched Biden and said, we think this number is the best because, you know, we can, we can dangle a little cheese in this mouse trap and it's not going to totally tank the economy. The, the Republicans can't get too mad at us because it's only 10,000, but it's just enough for us to be able to win back some of the youth vote. You look at Biden's numbers right now with millennials, with Gen Z. I mean, they are the lowest it has ever been for a Democrat president. So I really think this is the only reason they would even consider dangling this on the table. And we should be, you know, vehemently standing up and opposing this from passing for all the, you know, grounded principled reasons, if nothing else to not tank the economy. But I'm not even sure that this is uh, a serious promise. I mean, I think he's going to dangle this out as long as he can just to get the youth vote, just to get them excited, say, oh, well, we can only do this if we keep the House in, in 2023 and then see if they can t push out the vote in the midterms. Um, so I'm, I'm not even convinced they're actually going to do something, but I think they're going to dangle it as long as they can to get the youth excited. I feel like that is the kind of the MO of this administration. Like this seems to be the one issue with a lot of my more left leaning friends that that kind of woke them up to the fact that Joe Biden's. He doesn't tell the truth. Like yes. his tweet today saying, this is the greatest economy. We have the best economy. It's so good. Uh, oh, sorry. That was the, I mean, it's, <laughs> this is the issue that I've seen a lot of my friends kind of go, well, maybe this guy just isn't going to deliver on any of his promises. And that's sort of the problem with running a campaign where you're going to make everybody happy and do everything. But I do have to ask Jack, like, why are you so mean and hateful? This would be the best stimulus possible if you just canceled this debt. This would be a great economic stimulus. All of a sudden, people have purchasing power. Jack, why are you just against people having a good economy and having less debt? That question seems to make the assumption that we're in desperate need of economic stimulus right now, which if we look around, it's quite the contrary. If we were in desperate need of fiscal stimulus, the Fed would not be tightening. They would be loosening pol policy. So um, we're, by, by enacting more stimulus, what we're really doing is, is throwing more logs on the fire and the fire is already burning our faces at this point. Um, we, so the, the stimulus argument really doesn't hold any ground. The same case was made last year when they were debating how large the American Rescue Plan should be, uh, that we needed more stimulus. We needed, larger, we needed, we needed larger bills. We needed um, larger checks to be sent out. Um, and now pretty much everyone, it, including more progressive uh, economists, have admitted that they were wrong at this point um, because the, the economy had already recovered largely by that point and, and throwing another $2 trillion um, in, into the economy at, at a time when the output gap was estimated to be only about $700 billion is why we have inflation and it's why we have an overheated economy, why we have excess demand. So the idea that we would only add more stimulus into the package but by, by passing this bill is, is kind of ludicrous. Yeah, yeah Jack's I, the economist here. And but if I know one thing, even if it did stimulate the economy and you got people out there buying more products, buying more houses, I mean, we see this argument all the time on the left. We cancel student debt. Millennials will be free to buy things. That's great. But uh, I don't think anyone wants to buy a $15 gallon of milk, right? And that's what you risk if you keep pumping money into the economy and you've already got 80% of all dollars in circulation printed in the last two years. I mean, we're just seeing the tip of the iceberg and all this. And uh, it's on us to just push back against doing anything more that could increase this inflation. Yeah, the, the, the uh, podcast that I did with Alex Salter on um, inflation kind of walked through a lot of this and, and shrinking the balance sheets of the Fed uh, was, was really interesting. But Jack, I have to say, watching Janet Yellen as a longtime Ron Paul and the Fed boy from way back in the mid 2000s, seeing her admit that she didn't know what she was doing doesn't have. Uh, uh, whenever these guys start coming up with solutions, like it's, I think this is a great example of, well, we poll tested a number of $10,000 and just, I think this will do something. Is that just sort of where the American government is at at this point? Is there any hope, you know, of 
changing something relatively soon that is going to help some of this inflation and some of these out of control costs that we're seeing first in student loans. It was the canary in the coal mine. I, I, I don't have any faith that there will be solutions that actually solve the problems at hand. Um, what we're actually starting to see with, with folks like Len, uh, Yellen, like you mentioned, is the shifting of blame. Um, Ye Yellen is essentially passing the blame on onto Powell. Uh, sorry, onto Biden. Biden's passing the blame onto Powell. Powell blames supply chains, and it's just it's just an endless spiral of it's not me, it's it's something else. Um, none of them have, really want to admit their faults in in terms of um, always offering solutions that lead to more government spending, and then overlooking the fact that it was government spending in the first place that got us in this problem. So I, I don't have much faith. Um, I saw the op-ed by the president in the Wall Street Journal last week offering up some, some early signs that he, he wanted to offer solutions, but all of his solutions were actually more government spending, more subsidies, which only leads to more overheating and more inflation. So I don't have much hope on that front. Um, I, I, I think the only thing they can really do is um, ease up supply restraints and just wait for the excess savings and cash to to sort of flow through the economy. It's going to take a while. It's going to be painful, but there's not much they can do in terms of lowering inflation. Yeah, I want to give credit to Yellen for where it's due. I mean, it's so rare that you see a bureaucrat actually admit, you know, on live TV nonetheless, hey, I was wrong. I didn't know what I was doing, right? So kudos to her. Now, though, the, that's only as good as taking a step toward actually either course correcting in such a way that isn't going to increase inflation, which is what we're not seeing, or better yet, just just resign, you know, just just go into private life, right? Because clearly you being in this position, like most of these people in the Biden administration right now, it's not helping. <laughs> so either major course correct or go home, but actually glad to see a bureaucrat apologize and, and show some humility. It's refreshing. Yeah, I, I just met Jack like 20 minutes ago and I put him in charge. And, and it yeah, helps that you've got the, the British accent. Like that just makes me trust you even more when it comes to you can Sean, what is it about Americans that when we hear someone like Jack, we're like, yeah, that guy knows what what's up. I mean, it's it's just ingrained in us, I think. Yeah. You know, it's it's uh it's, Jack, now, it's now, where where are you from? Iowa, Nebraska? No, I'm jo I'm joking. Oh, you, oh, you, me? You, yeah, I'm yeah. <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah, Omaha, you got it. Yeah. <laughs> are, are, now, uh, are I? I am guessing you are here in America. Like you, did you? Were you born here? Were you brought here? What, what's your What's your backstory? No, I I came here in 2016 uh, to, to to do the On Cato to, to do the Cato internship, and I never left. Oh, very good. Yeah, I saw you wrote in the uh, sadly now somewhat defunct Cato Journal, um, which. Yes. Which well, I, it's uh, not defunct. It's evolved. I believe it has a new name now. It's relaunching. Okay, very yes. good. But yeah, so what what uh, what is it about America that made you want to come and and uh, you know plant your flag here? Well, I've always been very passionate about ideas, particularly ideas of, of um, free markets and limited government. And I'm very proud that the UK has has been the sort of home of all these ideas. You know, Adam Smith, John Locke, all of these amazing uh, philosophers and thinkers. But we exported most of those great ideas and then we sort of brushed them under the carpet, whereas you guys enshrined them in your constitution um, and, and, and you really sort of up upheld the torch of liberty for me. And so I always wanted to come here and, and be a part of be a part of the liberty movement here in the U.S. and uh, defend it for future generations. Very good. And Sean, you said you're a former progressive. What happened? Yeah, well, uh, I was raised in a small town. I was raised up the street from the... Uh, the uh, Baptist church and the gun club, but I was raised by non-religious, uh, you know, uh, liberals, right? So progressive upbringing and went into college, big Michael Moore fan, big Michael Bloomberg fan, was very excited to go in the classroom and hear about how we can all have all these great solutions from central planning and from raising taxes. I was excited, genuinely excited. And uh, then after about a semester of pure CRT and just, you know, black pilled, uh, leftist uh, faculty and and I saw the culture and just it's it's depressing I became depressed my colleagues were depressed and I said you know what like my gut's telling me there's a better way and you know thank goodness for young Americans for liberty being out on campuses actively recruiting planting these seeds with optimism and saying actually 
if you consider the Constitution, if you consider basic free market principles and limited government, if you're looking for solutions, you can find them there. Now, let's get you down the Ron Paul rabbit hole. Uh, and from there, the rest is history. But uh, always, you know, when I'm messaging and I'm out there writing, I'm thinking, okay, like, how can I reach that person who is like me, who is 19, who is questioning progressivism, and who can uh, is just looking to, to make things better, but realizing the government's not the answer. So before we wrap up, let's let's go back to student loans. If you're just the person who clicked on this episode because you want personal relief, um, what would you say to them? What could they do? And then B, how do we get a handle on rising prices? Is, is students walking away from college and enrollments dropping the answer? Is that sort of what how we're just going to, you know, some basic free market signals being sent? Sean, let's start with you. What, what do you say to uh, to folks who want an answer on how to solve the crisis or in their, their own situation? Yeah, and we've got to be leading as Liberty folks on providing solutions you know, right, that don't lead to a slippery slope to tyranny. So some things that we could be fighting for and looking for when in terms of the student debt crisis is let's knock the interest off these loans. Let's find ways to advocate for that because if the lenders have less incentive to profit, they're not going to be giving out those loans. And if you've got loans, then uh, it wouldn't be great to not have the interest on them, right? And to pay them back fairly. Uh, let's look for ways for students to get out of the loans through the bankruptcy courts, advocate for solutions there. Student loans are very hard to get out of through bankruptcy. One of the only loans that you really can't weasel out of, again, reduces the incentive for the lenders to give them out in the first place and lets people get out of uh, a predatory system, right? Um, thinking forward, right, we can advocate for freer abilities to invest in ESAs and 529s that lets you save a heck of a lot more for college uh, as a family, right? So if you've got loans, I mean, let's fight for the future and fight for the present in that way, but let's fight in such a way that is fair, right? It's not fair to turn to uh, you know blue collar workers, people who opted out of college, people who paid back their loans and ask you to ask them to pick up the pieces for you. I mean, I know that strikes a core just in basic human fairness, and, and you wouldn't want that on the other foot, right? And to your other point, Chris, about, okay, well, what can we do about the rising cost of college? Yeah, I think an answer is uh, not just walk away, but but really think and really you know advocate for responsibility in the next steps in your education. There are many things besides college that we could be advocating for and that high schools can prepare students to do instead of just shuttling to them toward university. Uh, but I really do think you're not going to see a drastic price drop in college and really solving this problem as a whole until you strike right at the core of this corrupt and bloated federal student loan program, right? You got to put a halt on that. It's a long shot, but, you know, if folks were to go all in on that in D.C., we were to run a pre grassroots pressure campaign that made it, you know, the issue, you could see a stop to that. Schools would have to reset their prices to, you know, a rate that we could actually afford. And to those who think, oh, well, that hurts disadvantaged folks, that hurts people in the inner cities, that hurts people who don't have savings. No, it actually gets them out of a system that would keep them, you know, in debt for years and years and years at the prospect of going to college and gets them to a point where they may actually be able to pay off these debts and these bills on their own accord, like we were able to in the 60s, 70s, and the 80s. So that's what I would say we need to do in no particular order. Jack? Well, that was a great list of responses, and uh, I, I have too much to add to that, but you asked the question about how you would talk to somebody who has debt and 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 what your solution would be or, or, or how you would try to explain to them why this method of, of forgiving student loan debt isn't, isn't the way to go forward. I would say that you made a choice when you went to college. Investing in, in higher education is a human capital investment. You got higher, you, you most likely got a higher skill set, better credentials and higher lifetime earnings than somebody who may, may have chosen something else. The average bachelor's degree graduate makes $30,000 a year more than the average high school graduate. Now you may have uh, student loan loan payments of three to four thousand dollars a year, but three to four thousand dollars a year in loan payments for a salary of thirty thousand dollars a year higher seems like a fair trade off to me. That's a choice you made, and you should be able to pay your debts if that was your choice. Uh, I also agree with what Sean said. I think this, the system is pretty broken. Um, I have faith in the market. Um, we, we've seen a tenfold increase in um, in 
in programming boot camps springing up all over the country, um, technical colleges, uh, the, the trades jobs are actually seeing a bit of a surge and uh, the salaries in those areas are actually not as low as people often perceive. People often perceive the trades as being a sort of blue collar and they sort of uh, put their noses up at, at, at those jobs, but they actually make fairly good salaries now. And so that's that's another alternative people can can look to. But it really involves something bigger, which is more of a cultural and political shift away from this orthodox view that everybody must go to college. You, you have to go to college. And it, it, it's been pushed for, for a good couple of decades now. And so there has to be a shift away from that. Uh, I'm a little less hopeful about that happening, but I do have faith in the market. I just remember being in co- in high school in the late 90s, early 2000s, graduated O2, like the charts you know, the, the little private colleges would come and say, listen, you come here for four years and you're going to graduate with a $60,000 a year job. You know, well, we graduated from high school in the middle of the 02 recession, graduated college in the middle of the 08 recession. Now I'm entering my prime earning years in the last two years. Like, eh, you know, so yeah, you if you're young and you're listening to this program, choose wisely. But I think that's a great point, Jack, that it's a capital investment. And I think if you change the framing of, of, how you view this you know it it can really you know you're, you're making an you made an investment in yourself all right guys shameless self-promotion time sean tima how can we follow you where can we follow your work absolutely go to twitter at liberty sean as well as uh, at ya liberty for all the great work that young americans for liberty's up to and that is s E A N Sean, not yes, the, the correct way, the S- old Irish way. Yeah, not the S H A U N. What is that about, Jack? Yeah, now the worst I ever saw, C H O N E. You had a baseball <laughs> player for the Angels a couple years ago. I don't know what they were thinking, but that's not Sean. That's Jack. Tony. Well, my my mother's Irish. So that's the only way to spell it, in my opinion. <laughs> um, yeah, you you can find my my bio and all my articles on my um, Young Voices bio page. And also my Twitter handle is on there if you want to follow me on Twitter. Very good, fellas. Thank you so much for coming here on The Chris Spangle Show. We look forward to speaking with you again. And thank you, dear listener, for listening. If you got something out of this, the best thing you can do is share it with your friends and family. Say, hey, take a look at this. All right, we will see you again soon.